Сегодня пресс-конференция посвященная пропаганде. Напоминаю, что такой глобус у себя в зуме и выбрать там и Максим Стефанович, weekly state TV monitoring analyst in partnership with Press Club Belarus and uh, Satio. Just a reminder to all the journalists, your questions can be referred to us via chat. Also, you can ask to be given the floor in the chat box. And if you want to ask a question in person to any of the speakers, We'll be happy to enable your microphone, to let you enable your microphone and use a voice to ask the, that question instead of typing it. So we had some preliminary questions in the announcement. How did the state media rhetoric change after the elections? Who are the main enemies of the Belarusians according to the propaganda? What has changed to the arrival of the Russian propagandists on the Belarusian TV, and how does Kremlin propaganda work out for the Belarusian agenda? Just an introductory word. I would like to ask our speakers to go ahead with that. So maybe Olga, you should be the one, the first, the first one to start. Okay, no problem. Just a few words about the issues, about the matters that have been identified. Well, first of all, uh, with the Russian media propagandists in Belarus, basically the Russian narratives are being broadcast uh, on the Belarusian TV, state TV, Enemy around, enemies around us, uh, Lithuania, Ukraine, Poland, the US, we're surrounded by enemies that uh, Russian media have special attitude to. Immediately there was this message getting across the Belarusian events equal to the Ukrainian Maidan. One of the key narrative bits is the incredible intention, incredible desire on the part of Poland to get a chunk of the Belarusian territory, to lop it up, lop it off. And the protest activities of the opposition are facilitating Belarus losing part of its territory or all of its territory together with the sovereignty. The prostate activity entails re revolution, Maidan, and as a consequence, social economic problems. The US are not lying there dormant. Initially, there was this point thrown in that uh, did not get much traction. Uh, the religious, uh, religious conflicts, religious misunderstanding in the society. And initially, it was even uh, suggested it was even intended to, to raise some uh, uh, domestic uh, frictions like between, between the nationalities in Belarus. But the two latter points, uh, religion and national differences, they did not pass. Uh, the others, enemies around us, uh, Maidan about to happen, the problems which are because of what the protests are doing, protesters are doing. This is still, well, quite alive on the Belarusian uh, state media. A special attitude to Belarusian symbols, historic symbols that also arose together with this Russian media propaganda spirit being parachuted into the state television. Now there is a further aggravation, further worsening, uh, up to the point that Belarusian symbols uh, can be abolished, can be banned. There can be this decision adopted. They are going to announce it a uh, symbol, so part of the symbolics, uh, the insignia of the Nazi regime or something as nasty as that, akin to the Nazi regime. Right, thank you. Pavluk, what can you elaborate? 
or possibly. Well, consider this. As for the Russian media propagandists paratrooping into the Belarusian state TV machine, we can slightly exaggerate their value because some people that became actors started working in Belarus. There are not too many of them. Uh, they did not spend too much time here. But all in all, uh, indeed, some changes have happened in the Belarusian propaganda machine. It got synced up with the Russian one in many ways. And uh, something that Olga has said, uh, these tendencies are really out there. As for the Belarusian TV, what they broadcast, the Belarusian media, uh, what the Russian media channels are broadcasting, uh, the target audience is different. And uh, it's coming in differently. In this case, we can see that this big love to Alexander Lukashenko, that the Kremlin propagandists were trying to convey in August, in, in September, it died down. Now it's possibly even coldish a bit. That, uh, that news is a bit cold. Because suddenly, all of a sudden, Belarus, uh, what, uh, Moscow started paying attention that it, can, it cannot uh, trust Belarus and everything. So this kind of media is not broadcast into the Belarusian audience. Uh, it's uh, typically occurring in the Russian media, but the love and passion that was there in, in August, it's, it's gone. It's gone now. This passion has turned, has gone cold. An important point, the Russian media, followed by some Belarusian ones, are all looking this political crisis uh, in, the Be in Belarus through the optics of experience of the Ukrainian Maidan. They're using even the Maidan and Bela Maidan terminology, this sort of thing, explicitly. Oftentimes, there are parallels. There, there's comparison drawn between uh, Viktor Yanukovych's and Alexander Lukashenko's actions. And quite recently, I've completed monitoring for September. One of the conclusions uh, the Russian experts uh, started or, uh, stopped being afraid that Lukashenko will flee to Russia the so, same way as Yanukovych did. And there are new points they generate. Uh, they have been generating. So how justified the loan was, whether we should, whether Russia should deepen uh, the union state integration with Belarus and so on. This is the Russian discourse. This is something that uh, the Russian audience is getting. For Belarus, uh, it sounds like this. Belarus is supporting uh, Russia and the Russian authorities uh, support uh, Lukashenko. This is broadcast in the Kremlin controlled media. The liberal Russian media are serving this content, are, are depicting the situation differently. Some Belarusian media borrow the narrative of the Russian liberal colleagues. For example, RBC interviews or Dorst TV Rain channel, where the questions uh, about the attitude to Russia voiced. Uh, these channels uh, are targeted, the, the main audience is uh, Russian uh, viewership. However, when the Belarusian opposition members voice through that, you know, this becomes embedded in the Belarusian context. It will matter also for the Belarusian society. And it's also quite important to know that, to note that uh, the prospects of further Russian-Belarusian relations development is somewhat different. Uh, between Belarusian and uh, Russian state-run channels. In Belarus, uh, the subject matter is status quo. In Russia, they discuss whether this uh, deepening is deepening relations uh, is, are worth it, uh, or whether should, some military bases should be put in Belarus. Some experts say that uh, this should be postponed until the time when the crisis is resolved, has been resolved. The others. Uh, uh, say that now is the favorable situation to put pressure on Minsk and try to promote this agenda, try to go ahead with this agenda. This agenda. However, in part, this is also typical for the Belarusian uh, audience, because the Russian federal channels, uh, news talk shows, not just the news, news and virtually not, not featuring this, but uh, Kiselev and Solovyov, uh, the likes of them, talk shows. Uh, it shows that uh, this kind of discourse can also happen in Belarus. Thank you, Pauluk. Thank you. Uh, maybe you can say something about the state-run political uh, 
political trends in, in the TV. Uh, yes, I've been monitoring this uh, since July, before the elections and uh, after the elections, so I can compare the underlying, the underpinning core of, of the TV was was the same, has, has been the same. Uh, is the stability versus chaos, uh, stability versus destruction, destruction caused by any or triggered by any political changes, and stability and creation was there before the elections, like the Lukashenko touring the regions, uh, highlighting the creative activity of the country, of the government, it is still there. This this narrative is still there. However, there have been a series of important changes uh, during the information warfare that uh, the TV, state TV channels are waging. If before the 9th of August, uh, the information attacks were pinpointed, they, they, they did not specifically target the West. Uh, they were also picking on Russia when it was necessary. And they were less uh, touching upon the uh, they were mostly talking about the domestic enemies of the authorities, of the government. Uh, Babarika, Tsapkala, long stories, uh, black mouth, bad mouthing their activities. And then there was a sharp turn for this anti-Maidan, anti anti-Western campaign kind of thing. So there were various explanation models put forward that were, try that were trying to show the viewership of the state-run channels the reasons of what was happening. Although right now we, we're looking at the flow is something uh, homogeneous, but uh, uh, this is not the case. Sometimes similar models are offered, but uh, that just uh, developed this. Seven stages of Bella Maidan. This was broadcast for a week. And then it gets replaced after some time with fighting the Nazi, fighting the fascism, fight, fighting the white, red, white national symbol. And Bella Maidan goes away. It gets moved to the to the to the side burner to the back burner for a time. At least it's 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 not there. When Lukashenko was reporting uh, evidence, uh, bringing evidence to light that was allegedly uh, showing at the Poland's involve, involvement. So it's it's not just one explanation model. It's multiple models, uh, four tiers of them: geopolitical, international models. That is basically paddled on and on and on that uh, the protests in Belarus are triggered from from beyond, from outside, that this is uh, trying to destabilize the political system of Belarus. And it's, it's just one link in the chain. The domestic content or the, the domestic uh, situation with these protests is, is, no, is, is not in focus, where there are such global reasons at play, according to them. So definitely they also broadcast typical Soviet uh, uh, conspirological messages uh, like NATO was compared to the writers of the apocalypse uh, at some points, so same as the Soviet propaganda dig, dig back in the day. So uh, Belarus is kind of a front post to fighting off uh, the Western ag aggression and the protests of the, 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 the domestic content on protests. Further, there was an aggravation, uh, the, trying to uh, shift the discussion not to the future but to the past uh, to put it into the 40s or the 90s uh, more favorable for the government uh, the 90s uh, the chaos uh, the collapse uh, following the collapse of the ussr uh, 1940s uh, fighting uh, war uh, fighting the war fighting the nazis uh, fighting the collaborationists the local people that collaborated with the nazis and so on this is this is the kind of rhetoric uh, the structure of opposition the coordination council the liberal channels uh, saying that they tell the telegram channels, uh, sorry, uh, trying to manipulate uh, the protesters against Latushka, Tikhanovsky, and so on. And then they try to marginalize uh, the protesters themselves, trying to play that, uh, play this tune that they're drinker, drunkards, they're drug addicts, uh, they're related to crime. So this uh, turns uh, into a model which is not sustainable, which is quite controversial per se, and it's, it's quite changeable. It, it, it changes quite a lot. But the score, this chaos versus stability, various anti-disinformation campaigns, and uh, uh, this keeps uh, getting, th that, that same old song plays on and on. Sometimes uh, they pick on specific situations, sometimes they use uh, di di different ways to, uh, to convey these messages just to augment the plot. Okay, thank you. Uh, just uh, Reminder to our press conference uh, that uh, your questions uh, can be asked into group chat and Zoom. You can also ask uh, to take the floor. I'm waiting for the 
interpretation there. Uh, right, here it comes. Thank you, Jura. Okay, the question from uh, ICLDS. What are the effective ways to fight against propaganda? Especially if people don't speak other languages and or are limited in using in usual in using uh, social media. How to confront the big media channels? Olga Pauluk Maxim, whoever's ready. Well, I would say this. Uh, some kind of scheme should be built. First, we need to realize what, say, the state-run media wants to get across, and then follow each element, starting from various cons conspiracy theories, cons try to uh, refute them, like through a, through a point-based discussion, argumentative discussion, and all the way to the, to the image of protesters, show some alternative frames, shots, uh, footage, uh, some alternative uh, media. I don't think that uh, alternative sources uh, should be broadcast immediately. First of all, the, the groundwork must be done. Some basic things need to be explained. And then, example by example, uh, point by point, show how the state-run TV manipulates them, tries to. Well, I would elaborate on what the colleague has said. In principle, I believe this question to be quite abstract because internet penetration in Belarus is quite well, it is quite high. So if we're talking about people that do not use the internet, these are people mostly of senior age and they don't have a different communication channel uh, that can be used to reach them. Because recently there have been issues with the dissemination of uh, independent press. I'm talking about Komsomolska Pravda in Belarus, Narodna Vola, Svoboda Novosti Plus. So this was the legitimate channel, hard copies, actual newspapers that the people from this uh, audience uh, could compare, uh, could read to compare. However, if these people do not subscribe, they're not, they're not subscribers uh, of these media, they don't uh, watch, so they, they don't do social media, they don't use internet, you know, they only watch TV. Then the only channel of communication for them is the talks uh, between conversations between people. Uh, these uh, conversations can be used to refute, uh, to bust the myths, uh, conspirological theories, but it's quite tough at that same time, because it, we cannot really say that, that they can get some additional information or they can voice their detailed um, position. So possibly this will be challenging. However, on the other hand, uh, the age per se is not a limiting factor. Uh, the interest or the lack of the, that interest to, to receive that information is the driving force or lack thereof accordingly. People even not having access to internet, uh, they ask questions and they try to critically assess what is being told to them, what is being told. So this works sometimes. Uh, critical thinking and media literacy, this, these are the two main stumbling blocks here. This is not something that can be handled overnight. This is not uh, something that can be done uh, well, sloppily. Uh, there will be two vectors. One would be geared towards uh, the government, uh, one, so the status quo, preserving the government. The other will be against that government. But again, discussion or refusal of these myths will be technically impossible, debunking these myths. Uh, so the, we will have to live with that for, somehow. Right, I would agree with Pauluk on this one, uh, specifically on this. If people of senior age, first and foremost, people in settlements, uh, rural settlements, where even cellular communication is a problem, let alone the internet, where they don't use internet. There are two sources that remain, two classical traditional sources of uh, information. Printed media that we have been having challenges, difficulties with, it has been tough about that. And I also see another way to convey the information. Some, well, we don't need to create alternative channels. So they have already been uh, tried and true. I mean, alternative ways to disseminate the printed media. And the second information source uh, to get information across to the people who don't use internet, social media, 
uh, they do talk to their neighbors. They do talk to their relatives, close ones, acquaintances, friends. We can try to reach them through these people, their inner circle. Yes, it takes time. Yes, it's not, not, not that efficient. However, uh, there's simply no other ways to convey the, the, to get the message across mm -hmm. that I see. Okay, thank you. Next question. Hello. How efficient is the anti-Western rhetoric of the Belarusian authorities? Who is this rhetoric aimed at? The Belarusian society or the Russian leadership? Yuri Viktorovich, Belarusian service of the Polish radio. So how effective is the anti-Western rhetoric on the part of the government and who is it geared towards, aimed against? Uh, well, talking about the rhetoric, uh, this uh, question must be split into several sub-questions. First of all, this is effective rhetoric for a certain part of the viewership, for a certain part of the population. First and foremost, we got to understand that uh, the society of today, the Belarusians of today, uh, are not even divided into those who are for and who are against. They are the ones uh, who are receiving the information from a state-run channel like BT, Belarusian television, and those uh, ge getting the effects from elsewhere. Or possibly they have personal experience of participating in certain events and certain activities of the protest nature. Those who actually witness uh, the events, uh, they are prone, so that they're not prone to this rhetoric. They do not even face this uh, rhetoric. They don't watch uh, the Belarusian television. Uh, for this reason, they are certain that the others uh, don't watch it either. People who live in small rural settlements, uh, uh, for whom this uh, provisional Belarusian TV, embodied by the BT and the state-run channel, is the only source of information. They, they, they seem to neglect that fact, to overlook it. Definitely, this rhetoric is geared towards not just uh, the Belarusians, not just those uh, located in Belarus, this rhetoric, uh, particularly broadcast through the Russian media, including uh, independent Russian media, that rhetoric is aimed at uh, the citizens, uh, the population of former Soviet Union countries. First and foremost, Ukraine, Moldova, and definitely the, Russia, the Russian Federation itself. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. Just a few points, literally. To answer this question, we have to, under, have to understand social science, social studies, sociology, whether this, whether preferences, geopolitical preferences are changing in Belarus. Uh, uh, Damaski showed the, the Belarus analytical workshop findings, uh, the survey, focus groups based. There was a certain change in the attitude towards Russia. It went down. And uh, the European Union has gained some points, uh, conversely. It's important to note that it's not just the impact of the media, although there is that as well. There is a, a number of factors at play here. And if, this, if before this political crisis, we could have been talking about predominantly the pure experiment, the relations uh, of Russia to uh, Belarus to Russia and Belarus to e EU. Uh, these figures, uh, when the population was asked, were kind of abstra abstract. But now we see that the Kremlin has supported Lukashenko during these crisis phenomena. And the people that uh, started protesting, that started, that for, that for the first time they discovered that the Kremlin can support someone they don't like, they started questioning. Uh, the Kremlin standpoint, the Kremlin stance. On the other, on the other hand, they started discussing more broadly what does friendship of Belarus and other countries mean, how it can be developed. And people start discovering not some abstract stuff as as they used to back then, back in the day, but they are looking and finding the facts. Who is actually supporting us and who is against who is them and who is against them. However, we got. Uh, monitor the change in the dynamic. If we were to, if we were, if we were to trust Vardamaski's uh, survey uh, results, 
uh, early this year there was a growth of pro-Russian moods, but then it's uh, then this tendency got reversed. Uh, Anti-Russian moods. Uh, so the sum of factors uh, has resulted in this. However, a short time frame is not enough, and one one survey is not what it takes uh, to draw some far-headed conclusions how propaganda has worked for the Belarusian society. As for the Russian viewership, uh, the, there are quite a lot of uh, surveys done in Russia, and we can say that uh, the attitude to Belarusians uh, has changed completely. And that attitude has, uh, has gotten less uh, well, appealing for Belarusians. The Russians don't like them as, as, as much as they used to. Well, I would add that uh, the pro-Western or anti-Western rhetoric of the, of the state-run TV has two directions, uh, two, two main points. Well, first of all, it's uh, to uh, in, in enhance the motivation of their uh, electorate, I mean the law enforcement. When you're fighting some Western aggression or Western threat, uh, so your motivation is much higher than when you simply oppose your own citizens. So the government has to show them that they are fighting the people uh, manipulated by the West, manipulated by the states that are aggressive towards Belarus. I believe this tactics uh, is quite successful for the state-run TV, and we see very tough, very violent uh, behavior patterns uh, on the part of the law enforcement. Ideological upbringing, that's the state-run TV mostly. So the working to address uh, Tikhanovskaya's uh, electorate, uh, other non-government supporters, uh, they can be all different. They, they can have different approaches there, same as Pauluk said. But the new proponents of uh, opposition are aimed at uh, by the TV. So Tikhanovskaya and other uh, politicians, uh, they are not really uh, socially oriented. They they simply strive to the West. Uh, the potential protesters that could have uh, supported the protests, a person that does not have a firm standpoint on this, when they see that uh, uh, the uh, opposition is working uh, to the right, to the Western interest, uh, this will boost the, their support. I mean, uh, the, the, they will support the government rather than the opposition. Uh, this does not uh, go for the people that uh, watch uh, TV regularly. They might watch it sometimes. A certain number of people are not supporting Belarus and uh, Belarusian protests because they th because they think this is not favoring Belarus. This is favoring somebody else's interests. Thank you. Next question, Ekaterina Persson. Uh, is it possible to say that the Belarusian TV is uh, triggering or? or uh, throwing oil to the fire of this civil conflict in Belarus. Well, I believe, uh, in a way, uh, partially, this statement is true, because there are some, there are some shows uh, that actually uh, use hate speech. There is dehumanization of political opponents, and there are also appeals, there are also calls upon violence that can be, can be construed as such anyway. Particularly, this is seen in the, on the STV channel, to a less extent on NTV and uh, uh, Belarus 1, to a lesser extent. However, if we were to imagine that people completely trust uh, to the information that they get uh, from these uh, TV channels, if we were to hypothesize that this also matches uh, that person's uh, viewpoint or understanding of the world around them, then yes, this can trigger the social conflict. This can provoke a fairly radical uh, conflict because it is already stipulated as an axiom that the protesters against the uh, Lukashenko authorities are not peaceful, that they engage in violence. The example of that violence are not really are not really given, but uh, well, they say it as if everybody is in on it and everybody knows. On the other hand, we see people who are being interrogated, uh, people who are excusing or people who are apologizing to for having used violence against the law enforcement. 
and that could be a convincing uh, that th these testimonies can be convincing for some uh, uh, audience uh, who share that view that uh, Lukashenko is the legitimate uh, president of Belarus. And only some minority is trying to dispute that, people out in the streets. Well, I would also point out that initially it might seem that the state TV is uh, calling upon dialogue, reconciliation, national peace, and uh, well, the advocates of the state TV may say that it's, it's not uh, triggering the conflict, it's uh, just demonstrating a radical reaction against its opponents, or again, reacting it against its radical opponents. However, this does not work that way, because ultimately the country is supposed to capitulate, uh, the large share of the population at least. You should uh, refuse uh, or you should forget your symbols, you should forget your protest rhetoric and maybe, maybe we will let you in on the dialogue, we will get, get you a seat at the negotiations table that we will uh, do on, on our conditions, that negotiations. So people are carrying on with their protests uh, and the state TV is stigmatizing the, the protesters. So this gap between the declarative uh, appeals uh, to reconciliation and peace and the rest of the content, which is quite aggressive, uh, conversely, which is quite aggressive and uh, bad-mouthing a vast number of the population, it's only deepening that conflict. So when we see some aggressive statements on the part of the law enforcement or the, the, the pro-government people, uh, they completely uh, Second, they they, uh, they parrot back what they heard in the in the uh, state states run TVs. Maybe they got it not from the TV but from other pro-government sources. But they just parroted it back. They they've internalized it. So they actually think it's real. I would also say that uh, for deepening the conflict, even for the identification of the conflict, uh, the state media are happy to jump on the economic agenda economic challenges, difficulties that they relate to the protest activity of the Belarusians. And they also link it uh, to the emergence of people who actively disagree with the situation with the government that's uh, in power right now. Uh, this works very well. You have problems, but these problems, uh, they, they were not there a year ago. Everything was just great. You were doing just great a year ago. Uh, this is the reason for your problems. Recently, there have been people out in the streets causing these problems, not, not for themselves mostly, but uh, for you. They're not causing it for themselves. Uh, I mean, they left the country for some reasons. They have the opportunity to stay away from the situation domestically. However, this activity on the part of those people, these actions are triggering uh, problems for you. And they, this is the root cause of your problems. So yes, this is deepening the conflict. And the, there, there is uh, even an attempt uh, to trigger confrontation between various groups. Thank you. Uh, there's a whole number of questions uh, from Galas Klarevska, from Detector Media, Ukraine. The first question, how do you think, uh, what, is, uh, what is the reason uh, for uh, yet another change of the editor-in-chief uh, of Komsomolska Pravda in Belarus? Uh, Kots uh, being replaced by Trif uh, with Trifilov. So what, what do you think was the reason to change the editor-in-chief? Well, first of all, is the requirement of the Belarusian legislation, because the law on media requires the editor-in-chief of the Belarusian media to be a Belarusian citizen. Before that, on two occasions, the editor-in-chief uh, were Russian citizens. This is a fairly important factor, although, yes, it could have been overlooked. It was possible to overlook it. However, on the other hand, the development of the media, of any media, any media outlets, uh, requires uh, mutual understanding within. And I do not rule out the fact uh, that the managing company, the publishing house, some of them decided uh, that this uh, position, this refill of uh, replacing costs will be a compromise. If some of the appointments uh, were really criticized by the journalists in the media outlet itself, now it will help, it might help uh, alleviate the pain. Yes, I'll agree on that. 
I'll agree with that. Uh, besides, for the compromise, this is a compromise choice. Everybody's got to. Everybody has to do what they do best. And most likely, the editor in chief is supposed to be the person can be the person that has actual experience of such work. The Komsomolska Pravda uh, is a commercial media, is a for-profit media. And for the proprietor, for the publishing house, uh, the slump in revenue, the slump, slump of circulation is also a marker uh, that causes them to adopt more popular decisions in terms of how they call the shots with the management, how they appoint, uh, appoint the editor-in-chief in particular. Is there internal resistance uh, in the Russian, in the, in, in, in the Belarusian media to try to combat the influence of Russian, Russian propaganda? I mean, some state-run media, I believe, that this is not entirely clear from the question. Well, I guess it's not it's not about uh, uh, the resistance. It's about the use of the pro propaganda, Russian propaganda, as far as the Belarusian government and TV uh, wanted. Yes, on the other hand, uh, on the on the one hand, they get uh, uh, commentators uh, anti and of anti Maidan persuasion in. Uh, there are fragments of Russian shows, but this is done in a selective way, in some selective manner. It is just done to convey the messages that the government wants. Obviously, if the Russian propaganda starts talking about, you know, starts pushing some agenda that is not particularly favorable by the Belarusian government, favored by the Belarusian government, uh, Solovyov, Kiselov, and others, uh, they are not uh, really paying compliments uh, to the Belarusian government. Well, this will be ignored. This, this will be uh, downplayed. Uh, the Belarusian propaganda is using the Russian narratives as, as long as it sees it, it necessary, or to the extent it sees it necessary. The Belarusian media have been filtering, have been always been filtering in this or another way, in this or another scale, to this or another scale, uh, the Russian information. They have been filtering it, and now this tendency still goes on. Thank you. So about the change, about the substitution of the editor-in-chief in Belarus, does that mean that uh, uh, the Russian propagandists uh, are leaving Belarus. Can we assume that these people have already done their job? Well, uh, the Russian propagandists have left Belarus a long time ago. This was when uh, Belarusian canceled the accreditation for all foreign journalists. This was when virtually all of them left. And it's not too many people we're talking about anyway. Uh, so up to a dozen people. 15 people tops, mainly technical experts. Uh, so if we're talking about people regularly employed, not just uh, parachuted into Belarus, uh, they have stayed here, but they have been here in the first place. If we use uh, the Sputnik Belarus publications as an indicator, then Sputnik Belarus in August was the media that was holier than thou, holier than the Pope, promoting the uh, Lukashenko's agenda. Now Sputnik Belarus, September, October, I mean, recently, it works as a rank and file pro-Russian edition, pro-Russian media outlet that might have a critical thorn to put in the, in the, in the side of Lukashenko. So I believe that we should not uh, exaggerate the meaning, the importance of that uh, lending party. That, that those propagandists were required for, for, at the right time. It was necessary to disrupt uh, the strike, the, the all-national strike. It took technical experts. However, at this point, there is a symbiosis that we, well, the merger between the Kremlin narratives and the, the ones that Belarusian propaganda system chooses itself, you know, there is some overlap. But it does not take uh, the Russian people to be, the Russian propagandists, the Russian journalists, uh, to come to Belarus, physically be present here. I'll just elaborate. It was not uh, just an, a necessary thing at the right time. It was uh, a demonstration. It was uh, the way for the Kremlin to show support in various areas, including the information agenda, uh, the information space. Uh, not much has been done. Not much has been adjusted. But there was so much information background about this uh, propagandist lending party. 
this this noise actually played the role played the, the biggest role it gave this vision of visibility that the, the optics was there was no was not even there yeah that's exactly the case uh, it was the marker to show the population that kremlin is supporting lukashenko before that there was like uh, an information war between 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 the moscow and russia uh, moscow russia and belarus we also give them uh, like uh, kremlin you wanted to show that uh, they give information support there is uh, anti-russian anti-belarusian information war going on and we are fighting this war together so it's kind of a demonstration of the unity in this and we should also uh, recall the fact that uh, in june july uh, Lukashenko was quite critical about the operation of the national media and the early August events uh, was really the confirmation to the fact he said that he explicitly that you you're not doing your job right and uh, the Russian propaganda is being sent to the TV channels the state run by the TV channels in Belarus you know, should uh, ramp up their effort and these are the role models for you to follow the information impact that you're supposed to leverage so this was augmented later on because uh, because of because of this lending party, all forms of uh, like uh, debunking stories, TV shows, uh, th 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 there was more of that on Belarusian TV and not just through the influence of the Russian uh, uh, propagandists. They were only uh, bringing their standards up to the Russian bar, up to the Russian standard. So STV and uh, other uh, columnists, uh, the, the sections they run, they are looking at uh, a more radical tv style the, the, the guided by this uh, more radical more harsh tv style of frequently unseen in belarus but frequently seen in russia so they, they have gotten fiercer basically a uh, question from yekaterina pearson uh, how in sync are the russian media and the belarusian media in terms of COVID coverage Right. We had a complete mismatch. It was completely out of sync when the first wave happened. These days, I wouldn't say uh, they are synced up. I would say that Belarus did not take a special stance. It started covering uh, the COVID pandemic in a similar way, same as other countries are doing COVID related stuff. But uh, at the same time, Belarus is sending a more powerful message about the vaccine uh, from Russia helping Belarus. Then the Russians uh, say that they want to help Belarus with vaccine. So there is uh, there are some points that are out of sync. And if the Belarusian media say that COVID must be combated, then most of the time we see a story a standalone story that says that you gotta wear your face masks, you gotta take certain measures. And the next story shows a direct refutal of that with, involving the top officials of the government, uh, top officials of the illegitimate regime, or people holding conferences without any protective measures, without any protective gear. So this is kind of, this looks a bit uh, inconsistent in a way, so to speak because Vladimir Putin is also inconsistent in that, despite the fact that the pandemic is more severe and the face masks are obligatory in more, in more regions. Uh, well, gloves are also uh, mandatory or are about to be mandatory in, in, in the public transport. However, Putin shows in public and holds mass events without any face mask. So this is the same practices like the there are must do for regular regular people but the top officials ignore them and the belarusian media also are pleased again to jump on the covid agenda to emphasize the union of the effort of the governments of russia and belarus uh, to combat the pandemic so this is yet another opportunity for them to show the uh, uh, homogeneity homogeneity of the interests and uh, the common vector of efforts. Thank you.
Есть вопрос для Максима. Звучит The question так. for Maxim. How is propaganda different uh, in various uh, state-run TV channels? This one is for Maxim. Well, the first distinction that immediately jumps at you is the style, the aggressive style. It's not just fierce, it's not just aggressive. It's uh, like a TV show, television show, or a television pamphlet. With Mukovoshik, Azarenok, Yuli Artyukhran. This is a kind of a show they put on. Uh, satire, fierce style uh, to aggress uh, their opponents. In this case, they are not limited by anything in the rhetoric. Nothing can be uh, used. The most brutal comparisons, the, mo the most brutal statements and points are used. On Belarus 1, there's less of that. Although, yes, there is this international review where the anchor is demonstrating something like that. But uh, BT1 tends to maintain a more classical style. And ONT is uh, aiming at uh, some analytical approach, some analytical way of serving facts. However, looking deeper, not from the viewpoint of style, but the content, although the content is quite similar, it's quite uh, homogene homogeneous, uh, the style of STV is contributing to this radical messages uh, that uh, ONT is not typical for. Is, is when they're talking about some consp conspirological geopolitical consequences. Uh, you, you don't see that on ONT, but uh, STV will talk about the spiritual war of the West, that the West is waging against us, and so on, which is not typical for uh, Yuri Groyer or for some of the ONT anchors. At the same time, the ONT is uh, uh, shifting towards this uh, sophistic style, trying to uh, embrace some of the points by the by the enemies, by the opponents. Uh, particularly, there was a recognition that uh, in Belarus there is a dictatorship, but uh, it was only done to say immediately after that uh, that it's exactly what the opposition is after. Uh, the, the current uh, powers that be are using this uh, the, the, their unlimited power to, for the benefit, and the opposition will use it to distract, uh, to destroy. The state media are also experimenting. They're shifting towards, uh, they've announced uh, the author's uh, journalism format. Uh, bloggers, Alexey Golikov from Brest, uh, he's now running his own column. Also, he's running a piece, uh, a, a section on TV. So I won't be surprised that uh, each uh, TV channel will try to leverage their own strong sides and elements and slight plural well, anal and analysts and the pluralism of opinions will be peddled by the ONT. STV will keep using this uh, satirical shows, uh, satirical uh, pieces, uh, trying to badmouth the, the, the opponents. But BT is quite aggressive. I mean. Andrei Krivashev and some other authors, uh, anchors on BT, they can also be quite calm, but uh, they will be using the hate speech, Belomaidan terminology is used, and so on. So if after the elections, uh, the, differ the difference between the TV channels was low, the difference uh, was little, although the information style uh, was, was the same. When the situation gets uh, normal, more or less, the autonomy of the channels, uh, is uh, boosted and they try to uh, engage in their own style of conveying messages to the population. Okay, dear colleagues, uh, I wish to remind uh, that we have uh, about 10 minutes remaining, so if you want to ask any questions to our speakers, now would be the time. Right, we do have uh, questions still un unasked. Uh, the question from Olga about the Russian media. Are there distinctions between state-run and independent uh, TV channels uh, of Russia with respect to Belarus? Yeah, there is. There is. Uh, the most important uh, bit, the, the, the biggest point, is uh, the use uh, or, or the use of the name Belarus. Previously, independent TV channels, uh, they simply emphasize they use Belarus, not Belarusia. For state-run media, they tend to emphasize that's uh, the, 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 the name is like with the Soviet Union, Belarusia, or Belarusia instead of Belarus. Well, that, that's a small bit uh, that, that uh, is visible, but nonetheless, 
Well, uh, otherwise, uh, they convey the main narratives, uh, same way, well, the same narratives, but in a different way. What are those narratives? First of all, uh, Russia is a friend. Russia is the country that uh, facilitates the resolution of the crisis. The West, the provisional West, the United uh, West is the enemy. Well, the, the West combined is the enemy, but uh, the state and run and independent media broadcast this, uh, this differently. Uh, the state run TV use blatant lie, very crude methods of manipulation. So they distort the facts, they pull stuff, they pull statements and uh, quotes out of, out of context. Uh, then TV rain, uh, independent TV channels are doing it in a much more sophisticated way. They're creating a certain milieu, a certain, a certain impression. And they let uh, the audience decide for themselves. So their manipulative and their rhetoric, they use manipul manipulative rhetoric. If, say, we're talking about the relations between Belarus and Russia, so they use these terms and messages as brother, people, brotherhood, uh, neighbors, uh, neighboring people, friends, aid, support. And the audience uh, keeps getting this impression that Russia's presence is favorable, is very favorable for the resolution of the current situation in Belarus. So the state-run media, they just uh, draw these conclusions uh, on their own way, the state-run uh, Russian channels. Incredible number of repetitions, uh, very crude language, contrast, uh, they use so we've, we've, we've talked about that. So yet that there is a attempt to destabilize, or that there is a, an attempt on the part of the government to stabilize the situation. And the opposition is trying to do the, the opposite, to aggravate the situation. Well, the, virtually the same narratives only served in a different way, because each of the TV channels uh, works uh, for the benefit of their own viewership. And that viewership is not necessarily Russian citizens. Those uh, non-state-run channels, independent channels, private channels, so they also work for the outside audiences, for the Ukrainians, for uh, Moldovans, Belarusians. OK, thank you. There's a question from Gala from Detector Media. Was there any coverage on the state-run TV of Belarus uh, of the recordings uh, of uh, conversations that uh, Nekta Telegram channel uh, posted? If yes, then how? Thank you. State-run Belarusian media. Well, uh, they keep referring to the Nekta channel uh, when they see fit. When they were talking about the negotiations, uh, this disrupted uh, that uh, message they were trying to send how Roman Bonarenka died. So I believe that uh, I, I haven't seen any serious discussion there. There were a couple references uh, from Pustavoy. And when there was this leak uh, of conversations, allegedly, Ace Month, uh, yeah, there were several statements, very, very vague, very mild statements to, to defend her. So they were not really looking to interpret uh, this uh, this leaked uh, kind of this leaked conversation. They, they largely tried to ignore it and avoid this, avoid the discussion. Thank you. Right, a question for Pauluk. The Belarusian propaganda has it become more aggressive, more crude, or it just uh, learns on the fly? Which which niches have they overlooked? Well, I don't have the data for to draw such conclusions to say whether it has or hasn't become more aggressive than it used to be. Of the stuff uh, that they were overlooked, well, first of all, the communication channels. So this is something they've uh, neglected. For quite a long time, uh, the state-run media couldn't go to, couldn't enter the YouTube uh, so to be perceived properly, to be perceived as something close to the people. Only now they're uh, making the serious attempts uh, to land there. But well, uh, feeling like a fish in the water, it's quite difficult for them on YouTube. They cannot really feel themselves. It's it's it's, it's not their comfort zone. Uh, maybe they'll get the bloggers on board who share their views. The loyalists, uh, the loyalists, uh, uh, proponents of the 
uh, current powers that be, but uh, there are not too, too many bloggers of, of that kind, video bloggers, I mean, to, to, go, to go around. If we take other communication channels, such as television, direct appeal to the audience, uh, to the viewership, I really don't know who of them who was forced, like Maxim, had to watch a two and a half hour uh, summary of the day because it, it, it's completely crazy, it, it's completely insane. Uh, I don't think that the audience uh, could have survived a, a two and a half hour uh, TV uh, news uh, edition. This was just uh, done to take the box uh, to resolve uh, the issue of receiving honorarius, the fee, receiving the fees, and not to convince somebody that all of that was true. At the same time, there are some shows uh, where conviction could have been reached. I mean, uh, the NTV channel, where periodically there is an attempt to, to start a discussion. And they sometimes uh, propagate different viewpoints, different standpoints. I don't, I, I don't, uh, I, ca I cannot say that there is a balance of opinions or they actually show the uh, radically opposite uh, viewpoints. Uh, but they can create this balance of opinions. The presence of a one person who is allegedly or some some is somehow uh, a member of the opposition, it's a way to legalize or to legitimize uh, that effort, uh, to legitimize the discussion. So yes, we, we've, we've gotten the other side involved. And uh, it also emphasizes that, uh, that most uh, arguments, most points by the opposition are futile because you can check this out. The other members of the audience are talking completely different things, are talking about completely different things. Newspapers is quite expensive because it takes printing, it takes this dissemination. Uh, so yeah, there are, there are some members of the audience who rely on printed media, but I don't really see newspapers, any convincing publications, uh, any convincing things. There are things that irritate, maybe provoke uh, the opponents of the powers that be, and particularly the Mukavoshik uh, column in the printed media. I don't, I don't think that he's actually convincing somebody of something, but uh, he triggers the conversation about himself, about the points that he puts forward. Yeah, it, that, 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 that part works. Okay, the final question of the day then, from Dmitry Karenko. Uh, Rain TV channel, does it promote uh, the pro-Western uh, agenda? No, uh, the TV Rain does not, uh, uh, anti-Western, uh, not anti-Western. I mean, clearly, uh, there is no clear uh, tendency to show anti-Western stuff, but TV Rain uses the method of contrast. They contrast stuff, like how Russia responds uh, to the events in Belarus. It reacts uh, in an active way, this active reaction, this active uh, attempt to influence. And at the same time, they serve the information as to how Europe responds, as to how Europe, Europe reacts. And they have this manipulative rhetoric involved that I mentioned, where we simply cannot avoid getting this impression that the Europe shows no response. It's, it's, it's very scrupulous, it's, it's very inactive, it's very, it's, it's deprived of emotion. So the audience, uh, the viewership, keeps getting this impression that there is no actual positive response on the part of Europe as to what's happening in Belarus. The interesting stuff on TV Rain is not just the rhetoric of, uh, uh, it's not just their rhetor rhetoric, it's not just the narrative. Uh, for the past two months, uh, state-run and independent Russian media alike are quite active to in, in broadcasting the information about the time frame of the transit of power, how soon, how soon the constitutional reform is going to take place. So uh, they are doing this. Uh, some of them are even uh, citing specific months and dates, but uh, they are, they're all clear that this is going to be uh, in 2021. 20, the next year is going to be a, a, a breakthrough. Right, thank you. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you for the agreement to participate and thank you for taking the questions.